Okay, we're ready to start. So we need to focus. So whatever that means to people. Uh, let's see. Today's Wednesday. That means tomorrow we have assessment. What number eleven? Wow, and we're going to have 14 total. Oh, that's right, and I've got two student presenters today, too. i got to remember that. I just saw Megan over there. Okay, so um, what we'll do is we'll start with any questions. We got the projector fixed. I have no idea what they did to it. I just called them, and they're pretty good. Maybe it could have been a ball. It could have been a loose wire. Who knows? Who cares? So yesterday, we talked about the five heat transfer mechanisms. <coughs> Four are very important to animals. <clears throat> the fifth one I included just to be uh, complete, I guess, right? Condensation versus evaporation. I think the videos and the reading made it uh, clear that they can all happen at the same time, especially the four main ones. Condensation couldn't happen at the same surface evaporation is, right? Because they're opposite processes, so it's some surface either not evaporating or evaporating or condensing, but those those two cannot happen at the same time at the same surface, but conduction, convection, thermal or solar radiation or electromagnetic radiation and evaporation can all be happening at the same time, and most animals it is, right? They're breathing, they breathe in air, they uh, release more humid air than they breathed in, so that's evaporation. I'm standing on the floor, I'm conducting heat to the floor in my shoe. Uh, I'm moving a little bit, so uh, convection is occurring in me, and uh, let's see, what am I missing? I'm radiating to the table, so I'm doing all four of those at right now. Okay, so anybody have any questions? Okay, oh yeah, before I forget, because I'll probably forget. Hopefully you under, you when you go to the quizzes, maybe I'll show that to you right now. There's like six clickable quizzes, so hopefully you don't uh, miss some of them. I'm sure there's some redundancies, there has to be. But uh, here we are, you know there's what, uh, three down here, but then if you go further down, there's three more. And those are not the same quiz, they're different. So like some of these have a big bucket. So there's uh, <coughs> 75 questions in this one and you get a random 20, okay? Uh, anybody know the answer to this one? After approximately one to two hours blank whelping, the bitch's body temperature blank. Anybody know this one? This is very interesting. Dog breeders tell me this is uh, I had a dog breeder in class one time and she goes, her dog, you know, when she gets near parturition, her dog runs away because she knows she has this rectal temperature probe. Anybody know the answer to that? Let's see. The kicker is, it's the second to the last one. One to two hours before whelping, which is a term meaning parturition in dogs, right? The bitch's body temperature decreases by two to three degrees. So it's an indication that the animal is going to give birth. And that one dog breeder I had in class, she was very religious at taking temperature every, about an hour before she thought, I mean, every hour until the dog gave birth. And it was very predictable for her animals. It drops and then you know you can hang, stay around and help the dog. Okay, so anyway, don't forget, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, uh, questions out there for uh, thermal regulation. Um, what I'm going to do is, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a few things from yesterday that I was going to show you, and then we'll do Megan, and then we'll do Grace's here too, right? You guys sitting together. We'll do those, so I'll do a song and dance here. Okay, so you know, and yet from yesterday, I was trying to make the point that something about wind chill. Now, wind chill can't really occur when it's warm out. Wind chill is a non-factor in the summer. You don't hear the weatherman going, today's high is 85 and the wind chill will be hmm. So wind chill is really only a factor for us and animals on the low end of the scale, like today or when it's 20 out. And the kicker is the primary factor of the environment is the temperature. So if it's 20 or minus 10, 
or minus 30, which I've seen on a thermometer on the wall outside, minus 30. Uh, so that's a very important factor. And then what's the next important factor after the temperature? It's the velocity of the air when you're down in that area. And that's called wind chill. And you can look these up and that's what the weathermen do. You know, there's all these uh, figures and I'll just show you one. But you gotta realize if there's no wind, there's no wind chill. And that's what this graph indicates. Calm, the temperatures, you know, there's no wind chill. But as soon as you start with the wind, that's the velocity, the flowing medium. So you know this is convection, right? Something's flowing. Then you go from, let's say, look at minus 30, where I was at one time, and look at you can get down to, you know, 69, whatever. So it makes quite a difference when you're outside because, and then they have frostbite time. So, you know, in 30 minutes, you can get frostbite in this range, 10 here, and five minutes in this range. Okay, so that's wind chill, very chartable thing. And then the other thing is if temperatures are on the other end of the scale, warm, then the weatherman doesn't mention wind chill, but if it's 95 out, they talk about the temperature humidity index, THI, because then on the hot end of the scale, humidity becomes the most, the second factor that you have to consider, okay? Uh, the velocity of the wind is in immaterial when it's hot. So then I look up temperature humidity index. I go to the images, and this makes sense when you're, like, let's say, handling animals. You don't want to move them. Oops, okay. Don't do this to me. Uh, there it is. I'll just enlarge that one. Okay, so here's beef cattle humi temperature humidity chart. So as you go more humid, that means there's less evaporation. Less room for water molecules to leave the liquid and go into the vapor. And so then you get uh, these apparent temperatures. So if it's like 86 degrees out, uh, yeah, here's 86, let's say 84, you go across, and this one's not quite reading right, let's see, where am I? I guess they don't, what they don't have is um, I want to go to a different one. That's that's fine, but it's harder to interpret. It's better to have one like this. Okay, so here's dairy cow temperature humidity index. So you've got humidity on this end, top and the temperature. So then let's say it's 90 degrees. Okay, let's see temperature. Okay, uh, all these things. I, I guess okay. <coughs> are just a little funky, and I'm not sure how to do that. Anyway, the point is, there's stress levels here, then mild to moderate stress, and severe stress, and then this is very severe stress, okay? Anyway, the te the, as temperature, or as humidity goes up, the severity of the temperature, the humidity is also increased. Those are not quite what I was looking for. Let me see if I can find one more. Uh, here's the one that I wanted to do. Here it is. Okay, so here's temperature that you see on the wall, right? And here's the relative humidity. And so the numbers are always higher. That's what I was looking for. Those other tables tell you the same thing, but they're not arranged like this. So let's say it's um, 80 degrees out and it's 80% humidity. Let's say 80% humidity. As you go higher, look at the in 94 degrees, it's basically saying it's 129 degrees. That's what it feels like, okay? So it's kind of like wind chill, but it's on the other end of the scale. So this is what it feels like, but this is actually what the absolute temperature is. So in this one, in this case, anything above 80 is a problem when humidity is above 40. Okay, then the last diagram I had was, um, yesterday we were talking about conductivity of the conductor, and I wanted to show you a table about that. So you can look up Thermal conductivity of materials. So if you're a good conductor, you're a poor insulator. But if you're a good insulator, you're a poor conductor, right? So then, one of these would be pretty good right here. We'll do this one. Okay, 
Now, unfortunately, these are listed alphabetically, not in the order of conductivity. But in, in essence, the higher the number over here, the better conductor. So what's got the highest number? Copper, uh, there's silver. Okay, so on this table, silver is a great thermal conductor, the best one here. And then next down is copper. And you can see aluminum's not bad. But look at air. Is air a good conductor or a good insulator. It's a fantastic insulator. Look at that number. Now here's the kicker though. It has to be still. Still air is a great insulator. But once it starts moving, remember the interface, you're making a new interface all the time if air is moving. So then air becomes wind chill if it's moving. But air, is air the best one up here? Pretty close. Paper is not bad. Okay, uh, I think air is air is the best ins insulator up there, right? So still air. And if you ever look at homes, there's like a lot of times they have double panes, and a lot of times what's between those two panes is air. But then sometimes they put a gas in there. I want to say it's argon, if I remember right, because then you know the cold on the outside pane. It doesn't transfer to the inside pane because you've got that air space there. But it's still, it's not moving. Okay, so Megan, come on down and I'll have you start your presentation. Do you have it on PowerPoint or something? Yes. Okay, good. We've got our projector working. So. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Megan is going to talk about heat, stress, and dairy cattle, right? Yeah. Okay. So take notes. This is great. A dairy cow is a walking furnace, and they get, of all the farm animals, they get heat stress the first. Definitely. Okay, and if you start with the point out which button is the label. And then 
at night it's cold, it's cooler, so you would want to feed your cattle then so they eat more because um, a symptom of heat stress is decreased feed intake. And then you want to provide shade so the cattle can go and cool off. And then you can reduce the actual temperature of the cow by helping them um, get rid of heat through evaporation. So you can sprint, you can add sprinklers in the barn to cool them off. But if you do that, you have to use a fan because otherwise the vapor that is resulting from evaporation will increase the humidity. And you don't want that. Okay. Anybody have any <coughs> questions on that or personal experience? It might be hard to understand, but I, I kind of agree with your numbers. Anything about 70 degrees Fahrenheit when you're on a dairy farm is like time to start doing things. And uh, notice she's talked about uh, the fans. Whenever you have a fan moving, that promotes convection, but it's also called forced convection, where you have some fan, which in a sense is a pump for air, and you're moving it. And sometimes, <coughs> some barns are dairy barns that I'm talking about. If you walk in them, they're, if you look up in the very peak of the roof, it's open. If you've ever seen that, you might think, oh, there's snow coming in. Remember, dairy cows can't get cold if the air is still. But they have the roof, the peak, open to the uh, air because then you have natural convection. And natural convection is happening today in this room. Everybody's heating the air that's by their skin, right? Because our skin is hotter than this air here. But then the warm air rises. And when everything, anytime you have hot air rising, that's natural convection. And a lot of barns take advantage of that, where the heat from the dairy cows rises and escapes through the roof. But then if you also notice, the side walls are open. And as that hot air is escaping, it actually naturally pulls in air from the side, which is going to be cooler than that's up on top. So you can have natural convection, and then if you turn the fans on, you've got forced convection happening probably all at the same time. And you have the sprinklers going because then the, uh, and she made a good point, you know, you got to have the fans running so you have the convection going across the cow and evaporating the water. So all very important, all very amazing. And the thing is, you said um, they drink 100 liters of water in yeah. a day, basically. And isn't that what I told you last Thursday in math? I said they make about 100 liters of saliva a day. And then you made the point that if they get hot, they'll probably drink less water, or, and that's why you said provide a lot of water, but then it's gonna decrease the amount of saliva, and like you say, then you get acidosis. And one last point. You know, the, the normal body temperature of a dairy cow is about 101.5, something like that, in all our domestic animals. But if you put a temperature probe in the rumen, right where all the bacteria are working, you'll get a reading of about 105. And what's amazing then, that's quite a liability when it's hot outside. And you have something in your body, a big body of water that's 105 degrees. So like, she's a walking furnace. It's amazing. Okay, thanks. Grace, why don't you come on down and do your presentation? Since we're doing that, I'll reset my camera. Grace is going to talk about birds, which is a very interesting topic. <coughs> I'm glad our projector is working today. Three main ones and give you guys a brief overview. 
The first will be Golar fluttering, which is used to cool down birds. And then I'll also talk about the feet and legs since they're the uninsulated parts of the birds because they don't have feathers there. And then I'll touch on posture and behavioral aspects of thermal regulation, which can just be a slight change in their orientation towards the sun. All right, so first let's talk about the feet and the legs. So as I mentioned, that part of the bird is uninsulated because it does not have any feathers covering them. And because of that, it's very easy to get old when it's really cold outside. So for an example, let's look at this seagull standing on ice. It has a normal body temperature, but its feet are getting very cold. And to prevent any kind of cold blood flowing back into the bird, the um, layout of their legs is really interesting. Their arteries and their veins are actually in contact with each other, as you can see here. So as we learned in um, cardiology, the blood flowing from the artery is one that's coming from the body core, and the blood coming from the vein is going to be really cold because it's coming from the feet. But when they go past each other, they have a countercurrent heat exchange. So the heat in the artery is going to flow into the vein, and it's going to warm the venual blood before it gets back to the body core, and that's also going to cool the arterial blood before it makes it to the feet. Because as we learned yesterday, heat is going to flow down the gradient. It's going to go from the warmer artery to the cooler vein. And this just makes it so like a seagull won't have its feet freeze in the winter and it minimizes energy needed to reheat the blood flowing back into the body. And what's the, you talk about normal body temperature referred, what, what's your figure that you usually use? I usually use 32 Celsius. Okay, I well, think in Fahrenheit it's around 100. I think it's about 106 or okay. something like that. Okay. So let's put 106. That's the normal temperature of a bird. Chicken, turkey, seagull. Okay, now I'm going to talk about some behavioral thermal regulatory techniques. So if you look in this photo, you can see that some of the birds are practicing tucking, which is just when they take one or one of their legs and bring it up close to their body. That's just to because the legs and the feet are uninsulated, they don't have any feathers on them to keep them warm, pulling them up close to their body helps keep them warm. You can also see that some of them will turn the head around and tuck it back into the wings. That's also just another technique to conserve body heat, decreasing the surface area of things available to wind and the cold air. Another thing too that I found really interesting is with nesting goals. They will constantly, so they can't move around when it's really hot out and there's no wind, they just have to sit on their nests. So they'll constantly rotate so that the front of them is facing the sun because that makes it, not only does it decrease the surface area that's getting solar radiation, but it also makes it so that the parts of them, their white face, their white neck, and their white breast feathers are facing the solar radiation, not the darker feathers on their back. And so it doesn't capture the solar radiation as much as darker colors. And here's a few more techniques. So the picture on the left, you can see this is a mom bird and these are her chicks. So they're standing in her shade because baby chicks do not gain thermoregulatory abilities for a couple days. So if they don't stand in the shade to cool down, they'll just die. And then birds a lot of times practice huddling. You can think of it as the penguins all huddling in a circle when they're cold. It's just to decrease the surface area that's available to the cold if it's really windy now. And remember, surface area is a, is a big factor in heat gain or heat loss. And so they're using their behavior to change how the surface area is exposed to the environment. All right, so the last thing I'm going to talk about is goaler fluttering. It's probably the most interesting thermoregulatory technique in birds. I'll show you a video in just a bit, but basically what it is is it's when the birds will cause a rapid vibration of the upper throat and the thin floor of their mouth, and that causes evaporation. It'll be easier to understand when I play this video. So is it kind of like uh, panting in dogs in one sense? Yeah. Okay. Sure, go ahead. Okay, this 
maybe enlarge it. Do they make a sound when they're doing no. that? Or it's okay, so they're not, it's not like some mating call or no. anything. It's just that movement, yeah. And as you can see, it's, their mouth will be open while they're doing it, but it's not moving at all. Yeah. It's just open so it can help with the evaporation. It's really interesting to watch. <laughs> Questions on that? Because we don't really get enough bird stuff. And unfortunately, we used to have a, a class called uh, avian physiology, but it's not offered anymore. The person retired, and I haven't been able to talk these two TAs into teaching avian physiology. It would be kind of fun. So, yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you. Very good. OK, yeah, don't forget your uh, thing. OK, so. They both brought up a lot of points, so let, let me summarize a little bit and then, you know, help you what to focus on and study. Yesterday we did, like, the physics of heat transfer, right? We talked about the names. Surface area is always a big one. Temperature difference is always a big one, right? Uh, you have a hot cup of coffee and we put it on this wall or the table. It's going to transfer heat to the table until there's equilibrium. If there's no temp temperature difference, there is no net heat flow, right? So you've got to have a difference in temperature for heat to flow. It always flows down its concentration gradient. And then, when you're raising animals, you should know that animals do something internally, unconsciously, like countercurrent heat exchange, right? You, you don't go, the bird doesn't go, okay, I'm going to do countercurrent heat exchange. No, it's going to automatically flow because those two vessels are by each other. And I know there's like a little video on uh, someplace in the reading on that. So there's internal physiological mechanisms that operate unconsciously. 
that do things with heat, heat flow, but then also behavior of an animal is very important. And this is probably where animal scientists sometimes don't appreciate how animals can kind of like choose the best thermal environment for themselves. That's why if you have animals, uh, you should give them a variety of places to be, to go, because then they'll, they'll search out uh, like the best place to sleep, you know, but if they're confined in uh, like a 10 by 12 uh, pen, there's really, they can't behaviorally change anything, right? They can't like get away from that environment or go to some place warmer or cooler, but there's a lot of behavioral things that can happen. Like huddling is very famous. If you go out west and it's cold, the cattle tend to group up. And as soon as you're touching somebody else, like look at, look at how much surface area I have in my two hands but I can immediately decrease it to zero by going like this. Now I have no surface area of my hand showing. And without the surface area exposed to the environment, it's just gonna, heat's gonna flow from one hand to another and they're probably the same. So decreasing surface area by behavioral changes is big, and the birds were a great example. And then there's things that we can do for animals, okay? And that's another thing I don't think some animal scientists appreciate. Like I talked about the dogs, the, the big dogs I used to have, the Newfoundlands. Nobody ever appreciated how much you have to work to keep them cool. I think I talked about ice, right? The, they were so perfect. They would stand up in the back of the pickup. I would throw ice down, and then they would lay on the ice. And can you imagine when it's 90 degrees out and your belly is all full of ice? It was a great thermal regulator. It was just perfect, okay? But I had to do that. So there were things I could do for them. I always kept them in the shade. I actually treated them like a dairy cow. As soon as 70 degrees came around, what am I gonna do to cool off my dogs? Don't take them, they were black too, right? So if it's sunny out, that's the worst color to be because that's the most absorbent of uh, thermal radiation. So there's a lot of things uh, that people can do. A lot of people don't understand it. I think the videos and the reading show you a lot. Um, there's one of the videos or the reading where it talks about how if you're in water versus air at the same temperature, water takes heat away from you 25 times faster than air at the same temperature. So like, even on a day when it's 90 degrees in Chicago, if somebody got dumped in Lake Michigan and they weren't rescued, they could die of hypothermia. Incredible. On a 90 degree day, you can die of hypothermia if you get dumped out in the lake. Especially out like, like uh, up by Duluth um, area there. The water never gets above 65 even in the summer. And that'll just suck your heat away. And when the Titanic sank, a lot of those people died of hypothermia, right? If they got into the water, boom, it's crazy. Okay, any other questions, comments? I think I'm gonna stop there. We'll see you in math tomorrow. A lot of, there's a lot of uh, online quizzes to look at. Make sure you expect some questions tomorrow on all today's stuff.